The story of this talk starts exactly 10 years ago today, kind of, because on that day I got married in yeah. um, Greece. And with, with, with the Greek lady, which is why I ended up after a year in the in UK, like, why I ended up one half year ago in, in Athens. Yeah. But it was also at that time I just finished, I just left the job as a kind of researcher in mathematics, and even though I didn't know that at the time, I was about to start a job at Fox Clinton, in a security company where I still work. And um, today we're going to talk about crypto. And in crypto, you have to, I can't combine my background in mathematics and my current job as a security person. That's what this button should have. Um, given the recent events, I thought this sufficed uh, uh, myself. So I'm talking about crypto, and I find it helpful to consider crypto as some kind of wall, some wall that protects your data in transit that you don't want others to read. And if you've been following security news, you will have known that uh, the wall, the crypto, often looks like this. For example, there was Google about about uh, one and a half year ago, by Google. Uh, there was a blockchain at the back of the one you used in the Alma protocol, and it was also a bit wrong with SHA-1, when it's say broken by the ES end, that's June of 2015, and, and many other bugs. So, what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to try to answer the question how broken are these protocols really? Is all this panic deserved? So, to set the scene, I'm going to talk about um, <coughs> encrypted, um, encrypted protocols uh, that relate to uh, data in transit. So, Alex tries to send something secretly uh, to Bob, and that's, it's a good, good to think of Alice as a web browser and of Bob as a web server. And of course, there's Eve, who's sitting there in the middle, who's trying to read uh, what Alice and Bob are uh, exchanging. And she often has capabilities of uh, modifying the data. Now, encryption of data transit takes three steps. The first step is authentication. In practice, it usually means that Bob proves out that he's really Bob. Then, Alice and Bob need to agree on some kind of key. And using that key, they can encrypt the data exchange. The four or five examples I'm going to talk about all refer to one of these stages. And I'm for practical reasons, I'm doing it in a slightly different order. I should also say what I'm not going to talk about. Uh, I'm not going to give you any excuse not to use the latest and greatest crypto, and please don't take my conclusions uh, on my talk this way. So I'm not going to say, oh, it's okay to use outdated crypto. I'm just going to say it's, it's not as bad as I was making out to be. Uh, I'm also going to talk about implementation issues, but I won't mention here that implementing crypto is hard. People often make mistakes and uh, these mistakes can have serious consequences. And one particular kind of implementation issue is using keys that are too short. Crypto keys come to the length, and if the length isn't short enough, you can get this brute force error. Sometimes you can, someone with a better middle position, can force the, the two parties to use a shorter key than as opposed to. I think that's a kind of implementation issue. And finally, I'm not going to talk about QVC. Which is a random number generator that is backward by the NSA. I think this is the most fascinating crypto story of recent years. But it's also kind of um, it's easy to, to think that this example, which is a, a protocol that was deliberately backdoor in a way that uh, those who put the backdoor there, the NSA, could actually exploit it. The, all the other protocols and, and the ones I'm talking about, that's, the weakness wasn't deliberately inserted, and it isn't that easy to exploit it because it's anyway. But that would be an exception. Okay, so Diffie Helmet. Diffie Helmet is a key exchange protocol, and it's a bit of a misnomer because, as we'll see, uh, it's actually a protocol where the two parties, Alice and Bob, together generate. So Alice and Bob use something called a group G, uh, which is something in mathematics you don't have to know, but I mean, just think about it, think of it as, as a large fragment. So they agree on this large fragment number publicly. So in this case, Alice suggests something, Bob says it's fine. 
and that's the other way around. You can complete a block says no, please use another one, and then finally agree on something. Then they use secret numbers, so large random numbers, A for Alice and B for Bob, that they don't share, but they store locally. And Alice then combines this group G that we've shared and her secret number A to create another number G to the power of A. You don't have to understand what this means, just the way something that she can easily compute. And she shares this with Bob. And likewise, Bob computes G to the power of B, and she has it with Alice. And Using this, uh, sorry, no, Alice then has, takes a G to the power of B that Bob shared with her, combines it with her own secret number A, and she takes another number called G to the power of B to the power of A that she keeps for herself, and Bob computes G to the power of B to the power of B. And because mathematics is kind, these two numbers are in fact the same. Uh, and this is the secret key they will use. And the reason this works is that it is impossible to derive the secret key from G, D to the power A, G to the power B, these are the three numbers that we call these were, that have been shared up here. So Eve, in her book of man, the woman in the middle position, she knows G, G to the power A, G to the power B, but she cannot compute this key. That's not entirely true. She can. It's not impossible to do it, it's just extremely hard. Um, that was a 24 bit Vivi Hellman, that's quite commonly used. Cost about $100 million to create. No one will ever pay the price to crack a single encryption key. And I know the NSA budget is many times this, but still, um, it's not worth for, even for them to crack the key of uh, the next big lad or of Vladimir Putin or of Donald Trump. But okay, let's look at how such hypothetical attack would work. And actually, it takes two steps. So the first, Step the first part that only uses properties of the group G. And then only the second step, uh, second part is numbers G to the power A and G to the power B are being used. So think for a moment what this means if many elements and bombs use the same group G. And it turns out they do. Lots of HTTPS and VPN implementations use the same group G. So, this means that for $100 million worth of preparations, someone like the NSA can, do, can crack, uh, can do the first step once for all, spending a lot of money, but still, but then uh, you, after this, they can crack uh, all the different key exchanges in near real time. And this is called the log jam attack. And this is actually uh, what we believe the NSA has done to break. Many VPN connections. So, is Diffie Hummel as a protocol broken? Uh, no, the protocol has not been broken. Uh, the 48 bit Diffie Hummel, which is twice the size, remains extremely secure. In practice, the 2024 bit Diffie Hummel is secure if you choose a unique group G, but it's best to avoid it. If only because it, it's not always a good idea to uh, choose these groups yourself. That's why it's that's how people refer to publicly uh, published groups. Um, yeah, okay. So Alice and Bob have now generated a key using Vivian, for example, and they can actually exchange the encrypted data. And one way to do that is using uh, version 3 of the SL protocol, which is all, which is why it's a bit broken. And it uses the block cipher. And the idea is that uh, you, you got the the plain text and unscripted text into blocks, and then you encrypt those. But actually, you need to make the blocks a little bit nicer. Firstly, you add some map that matches some navigation code, some kind of signature to avoid tampering uh, data. And because uh, block cyphers need block, full blocks, uh, you fill the final block. And you do that by adding something called padding. And in this case, in SL3, the padding works as follows. The the final byte of the padding contains the length of the rest of the pack. So in this case, the is 5, so the final byte contains 4, and the rest can be whatever. Bob, who gets this encrypted data, decrypts it, then looks at the final byte of the padding, 4, throws it away, throws away the previous 4 bytes, and then gets uh, the plain text with the map, which you can check. If you now think, hey, that's odd, the, the padding is not covered by the uh, map signature, that's correct, that's one of the things that 
they drop. Now, HTTP has a lot of nice properties for attackers, and like HTTP and HTTPS. And one thing is that ETH in a man and build position can use some JavaScript, for example, when I insert it in a uh, cryptography, can force Alice to make certain requests. And she can force her to make post requests, uh, which is, if you know HTTP, that's it's one of the two most common HTTP requests. And she can force, uh, she has some uh, variation there, and the variation in two parts of the request somewhere near the beginning and somewhere near the end. And by varying this, she can make sure that the plain text plus the, the Mac and the padding, uh, in this case the padding fills the full final block. And because that always has to be padding, and sometimes the whole final block uh, is padding, and Eve wants that, and she can force that. And at the same time, she can also for, force the final byte of a block. Sorry, uh, sorry. She can force a particular byte that she wants to crack. She can force it to be the final byte of one of the blocks in the box cipher. Using this, Alice makes this request to a block. What does what Eve does is she takes the final block, which she knows is the encrypted packet. She throws it away. She replaces it by this the encrypted version of this particular block in the middle. She doesn't know what it says. She just knows that this is the encrypted cookie for the last eight bytes of the cookie in this case. She puts it there, sends it on to Bob, who doesn't suspect anything. Now what Bob does is he decrypts it and he looks at the final byte, checks uh, what the number it throws it away and there are many bytes of padding it throws away as well. This usually doesn't make sense, but if, if the block times eight, if the final byte decrypts to seven, it makes sense because the rest of the packet can be anything, so Bob throws it away and he doesn't throw an error. Now Eve can see what Bob says to Alice, so he knows when he does or doesn't throw an error. So if, he just try, if she just tries many times with different keys by uh, forcing the connection to be reset, at some point the final byte will decrypt to seven, which means that uh, Eve knows that. Uh, the final byte of this block that she doesn't know the encryption set, but she can fill it in into the encryption scheme. It's something you can look at at home and you can sign for change. It's a bit too fiddly to put it on the slide, but it's it's fairly trivial, and she can decrypt the, uh, this one byte, and then she can move things around a bit by by taking the, the access like the first a bit longer and after the bit shorter or vice versa, and she can decrypt another part. And because there are 256 bytes, every time there's probably that many attacks to get to, to be lucky. And so, by the bytes, you can decrypt uh, the, in this case, the session cookie. This is called the Poodle Attacking Network, which was really first discovered in, in October 2014 by some people from Google. It makes it easy for Eve to crack something like a session cookie under reasonable circumstances that in practice are quite often met. Cookie need to be a, needs to be a predictable place. Um, it does require HTTPS, and you can use SSL or SFTP, FTP, etc. But in this case, Eve can't force us to make certain requests. So we really, really need HTTP. Um, it's good to know it does not allow Eve to decrypt to, to decrypt full requests or any part of the response. It really allows it to decrypt something at a predictable place in the request. And Session hijacks are bad. I mean, it, you probably know about session hijacks, but the idea is that you set by the computer, you walk away, and someone sits on your chair. But for the, the thing what people always worry about, online banking, and there are quite a few banks still working with Poodle, they have a lot of protections in place because at the moment you do something potentially malicious, like sending money, the, you need to enter like the code that you get by a mobile phone, so which the attack usually doesn't have. So if you do this from an internet cafe or from Starbucks, someone is you in a Google attack, they still can't uh, attack you without doing something else, so they can't steal your money. So session hijacks are bad, you should really avoid them, but they're not the end of the world for most uh, websites where it really matters. Okay, there's another way to uh, Encrypt, encrypt the, the, 
Play the stream if you have um, a secret key. Uh, we're using the stream cipher, for example, RC4. Um, RC4 is such a short algorithm, it is Ruby and Ruby and fixes one tweet. Um, it's a stream cipher rather than a block cipher. You by the, <coughs> the key and the, using the key you generate a stream of <coughs> pseudo random numbers and then you just export this stream with your plain text. That's the different ones. Both plus the same and excel again, and that gives you the plain text again. Um, if you look at R4, the actual algorithm written out, it, it's so simple that this can't be good enough. You, you should be able to practice by hand. And then you can't. Um, it's very easy to implement. It's uh, very popular. In, it's very easy to implement so in software. A lot of encryption algorithms are implemented hard, are written to be implemented hard. But this is great for software. For this reason, it's extremely popular in malware. It still is. Um, but it has some weaknesses and it has many subtle and other subtle, uh, not just subtle biases. Which means that if you encrypt the same text with Different keys, if you do that, that certain bytes of the output, the output have, uh, are more likely to be one byte than another. And if you then do this many, many times and combine all the devices, you may get an idea of many of the bytes of the, of the plain text. Uh, but you really have to do this many, many times. So the, the best known attack at the moment takes about 75 hours. Of many of the of, of Eve forcing Alice to make requests to Bob. And the, the bottleneck here is the internet connection, so even if you have a supercomputer, you still can't do this any faster. After 75 hours, she still, she still doesn't have the session computer. She has enough candidates to brute force the supercomputer. Now, this is great research, it's also extremely impractical, no one's going to use that. There's another vulnerability, it's called Drown. It's, it's kind of an implementation issue, but I still want to uh, uh, mention it in one slide. So it's an attack against SSL2, which is an even older version of SSL2. Um, it uses a padding oracle, which is something similar to Google does, where you, uh, you, you keep padding, you keep trying padding, and, and you see whether <coughs> it's acceptable or not. And you combine it with some clever mathematics and something called a, a blight attack. And you can crack the prime error state or the private key. And why is this a problem? Is that this key is often shared between servers. And some servers are less important than others, but if you can crack the same key on a Wii server, it's a lot of why does it matter if it's not support as well too, then you can get the same key uh, for some server, like the web key or server. In the worst case scenario or best case scenario, depending on whether you're the attacker or the defender, it is a very cheap protocol, but still it doesn't scale well. Men in the middle attacks don't scale well. And, and it's actually, uh, most of this actually is a problem with OpenSSL and OpenSSL implementations. Basically, OpenSSL still implements SSL2, it doesn't support it officially, but it turns out in many cases, even if it says it doesn't support it, if you then pretend it does, it will happily uh, use SSL2. So, conclusion thus far. If you have as protocol, it's safe, but keep in mind the size of the key that you're using. SSL3, you should just avoid, especially for HTTPS. And we're now at TLS 1.2, which is like SSL6, so there's no reason to support SSL3. RC4 it isn't broken in practice, there are quite a few implementations that are broken, but there are better alternatives than RC4, most of which are using, is involved using block cycles, but not messing up. SL3 and this don't support it to not even on the secret data account. Okay, shower. I've just shown that it can be um, you can make many mistakes when uh, trying to encrypt data, but encryption is relatively easy. It's authentication that's hard. Because authentication involves something that how how does Alice know Bob? Uh, who is Bob? It's almost like a philosophical question. So, but Bob authenticates to Alice by signing something with a private key corresponding to the public key. A certificate, uh, a certificate is signed with a private key corresponding to the public key. Another certificate, and this certificate is then signed with a private key corresponding to the public key. The certificate Alice already has. This is confusing. The idea is you have 
uh, something, it's signed with a certificate, but it's signed with it's also signed at its final certificate. It's something that I was already known, so I was already trusted. It's a, it's a chain of trust, basically. Um, now, Eve wants to pretend to be Bob. So, if Eve can fake this certificate, Bob's certificate, so that the signature is still valid, so she has she can, so it's her own certificate, but with a valid certificate, signature, she can impersonate Bob. So, this is what a certificate looks like. Um, let's, let's simplify that's four bytes. It's some information on the certificate itself, information on the signer, the next level certificate. There's the public key, which is uh, it's corresponding to the private key used for signing, and there's the signature itself. And in fact, the signature, if it's a cryptographic operation, um, first one takes the hash of the first three blocks and then signs it. And you probably know what cryptographic hash is, but in case you don't, it's, it's called one way encryption. It turns an arbitrary skit of bytes into a fixed length block. It doesn't give away any, any information about the original. So this can be five, that's SHA1, that's one and a half, that's SHA2, I've seen some several other hashing algorithms. Uh, for example, if they can string Hello World, then a SHA1 of it, it's, it's white sequence, you change one bit in uh, the original, in Hello World, you capitalize the A, which is really one big change, you get something completely unrelated, so that's why you, you can't go back. So what would go wrong? Well, Eve could, if, if Eve is able to replace the top three blocks of the certificate with something that's still a valid certificate, uh, but with a public key corresponding to a private key that she has, so the hashes are the same, and hashes can be the same, because there's only a limited number of hashes, even if it's very large, then she could send this uh, inspection, this puts Bob's certificate. Signature underneath, you can send this to Alice and it completely validates. Everything is fine. So, okay, read from bottom. From, from, from top it's easy, from bottom it's difficult. Uh, but I'll read from bottom. Uh, so, Eve tries to find a certificate with the same SHA1 hash of top three blocks as the giver certificate of Bob. A slightly easier version of that is to find an arbitrary block of bytes with a SHA1 hash equal to that of another block. But basically, dropping the requirement that it has to be just two blocks of bytes. Uh, one block of bytes with a uh, hash the same to that of another block. Slightly easier is if you, if neither of the blocks is given, if you just say, okay, find two blocks of bytes with the same SHA1 hash. And an even easier version of that is uh, to find a hash collision, this is called a hash collision, uh, of a weaker form of SHA1. Uh, I think I'm not doing it. I it later, but. Okay, I, I think I got five based on the uh, But I'll try to speak even faster. Uh, so this is what Eve wants. And this is where we are now. This is the, the state of research now. Mark's state was like from, from C.W.I. in the Netherlands. Uh, he, uh, he found this. Collision. This is what uh, this is where Shaman is, is probably broken, as in uh, you really shouldn't avoid it and, and you, should, you should have stopped using it. Um, it will take a long time, many years, to go from this to what he wants. So, even though Shaman is great, we, it still will take many years. So, why is it from panic? Well, they just be honest, uh, as you know, called MP5, which was used until fairly recently. In 1996, someone already pointed out that, well, it wasn't actually an attack, but we were getting close. And for years, people said, yeah, okay, okay, we'll stop using it. But they didn't really, and they're still using certificates. And in 2012, Flame Malware used this to forge, um, to, to fake the uh, certificate of Microsoft update server, and thus install very advanced malware. And so it's on the Middle East. And, and so people are now rightly worried about SHA1. Something happening, something similar happening to SHA1, so they're about to uh, so they're phasing it out, but it, it's complicated. Um, if I buy a certificate now, it may last for three years, and it would sign with SHA1, and tomorrow all browsers say, stop using SHA1, I'm in trouble. So you can't just do that. So you need to tell people, right, from this day, you won't 
class certificates, which are ones signed after this thing, etc. So this is what's been happening now. This is also important to know. This is not something that you can just solve for yourself, but you can draw SSL free support for your web server and you don't have to worry about Poodle, even if all the world is still working with Poodle. But um, in this case, it won't help because uh, stopping someone won't help you because Eve can uh, do the same thing with an intermediate certificate. So she can forge an intermediate certificate, she can sign, she can create a completely fake certificate, but valid and sign with this intermediate certificate, if that makes sense. But the most important thing to, to note about this is that it's not something you individually can solve for your website or domain or something. So, faking out will last years and has already hurt some people uh, because. People who couldn't access the website, the website for various reasons. Uh, flame light attacks have been mitigated, but it's a bit more complicated than that. That's not fair. Um, okay, so conclusions. I, I hopefully make the point that most of these vulnerabilities aren't as bad as people make them out to be. So why bother? Well, first, the attacks only get better, not worse. So you better stop doing it before it gets bad. Uh, I may be wrong. I mean, for all I know. Some people have suggested that, but I don't think there's any evidence for it. But for all I know, the NSA may have an actual working real time attack against RC4. And also, it shows that you care. If you're a bank and you're vulnerable to Poodle, then it may not allow people to steal money. But how do I know if you still have an update to Poodle? How do I know that you can fix uh, cross site scripting or C protection vulnerabilities immediately? But do please remember. Um, it's easy to scan the internet or the top 1 million or less domains for all the servers supporting SO2 or SO3 or RC4, etc. And then write a report about it in a blog post and get picked up by all the website, uh, security news media. Uh, the fact that this vulnerability is so easy to detect doesn't mean this vulnerability is so easy to exploit. On top of that, um, it, these uh, scans often don't check for, uh, are not able to check for mitigations as many of these ways. And there are also millions of servers that do not support HTTPS at all, which is far worse than weakness. Than weakness. And probably most importantly, you should pass these things, but a cryptographic protocol is unlikely to be a weak thing in your organization. People who both won't detect your RC4. So let's look back at this wall. Broken. Maybe there's a brick missing. And if, if this is the wall to your house and there's a brick missing, you're going to replace it. But it doesn't mean that people can break in through this one brick. Uh, that's what I wanted to say.